My name is Alexandra, and I will be your moderator for today. The agenda has plenty of interesting briefings, and without saying more, I want to introduce you the first speaker. I think that you are all waiting for Mohamed Bedoui. Um, he's a senior security re researcher and a penetration tester at DTS Solution with more than 30 years of technical experience. He has been working in different fields from government to telecom or power and energy providers. He will have a presentation about how to build a weaponized honeybot. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. OK. You hear me? OK, perfect. Um, today, uh, we're going to speak about uh, building a weaponized honeypot. I'm always fascinating about this idea of building a system which can defend itself. It's, it's, it's pretty much amazing, you know? And uh, a honeypot, it's, it's very good to, to come up with such idea. So let's start up with something very simple. So we will go through an introduction and facts about honeypots, right? So honeypots are a decoy monitored system. So it's a decoy system. Uh, its main purpose and idea is to deceive users who are interacting with it and uh, to collect and gather as much as information as possible, right? And it's heavily monitored also. Uh, detecting a honeypot can get a little bit tricky, right? Uh, but once it happens, it can be very dangerous on your infrastructure because if it's like a highly interactive honeypot, and we'll get to this later on, uh, it can be used as a starting attack point to compromise other connected systems. Uh, also, honeypots can decrease the gap between security threats and security solutions. Everyone has IPS, IDS, antivirus in his environment, right? And honeypots is pretty much effective in lowering the false positive threats in terms of how your systems detect and identify threats. Uh, also, honeypots can function as stress reliever in case of resistant attacks. So a malicious user is attacking your environment, and he's stressing very hard, and you can like distract him for a while while you are maintaining your infrastructure and see exactly what's going on in your systems and try to work on it and batch it on the fly. So uh, the first publicly available honeypot was, by, was made by Fred Cohen's, uh, and it was called the Deception Toolkit in 1998. So uh, honeypots can be classified in way different things. So what matters us in this talk is the classification by design. So we have low interaction honeypots and high interaction honeypots. Uh, of course, we can uh, classify them by usage, for example. So we have research honeypots and we have production honeypots. Uh, we can, there, is, there is a lot of uh, classification we can use, but for this presentation, the for sake this presentation, we're going to use the bird design. So the low interaction honeypots, they emulate services. They are not fully honeypots. So it emulates the service. And it has like some limited commands. So for example, the most famous one. So we have FTB, you can list files, you can go through files, maybe you can put a file, but you cannot delete file, for example. So you don't have the entire functionality of the FTB. Uh, the intruder's interactions are limited, of course, till the limit of the emulation provided by the honeypot. So the low interaction honeypots are easily detected. So a malicious user is playing with your environment and you are using a low interaction honeypot, the chances you are getting detected is very high. And the good thing about the low interaction honeypots is that they are using a relatively a few hardware resources. So to implement and deploy a low interaction honeypot, it will not take a lot of time, it will not take a lot of effort, it doesn't need any technical expertise at all, and at the same time, it's going to save you the resources, but on the other hand, it's going to be bad in terms of detection. Uh, on the contrary, the high interaction honeypots are different a little bit, so they work fully by implementing a service, so you have an entire service, an entire operating system, an entire stack with services. And the attacker or the malicious user has the full access, full bridge of interacting with your system, full comments for FTB or whatever you are trying to emulate. So the interaction of the limited user, the attacker or the intruder, is limited to his imagination. So whatever he wants to do, he can do. 
He can totally pop the, the, the server. He can, whatever he can do, he will do. But the problem with these guys, this uh, kind of honeypots, it uses a lot of resources. And it takes a lot of technical expertise to maintain it and to deploy it. Uh, so, this is very important. Honeypots need to be well configured. Otherwise, they can pose a serious security risk to your environment. So imagine that you are using a high interactive honeypot in your infrastructure, and a malicious user has been able to pop it. And this honeypot is connected to, for example, it's in your DMZ, and it's connected to your web server, to your mail server, because, of course, you have to reroute traffic, which is hitting your mail server or web server. And from there, he used it as an attack point to attack your mail server or web server. So it's going to pose a, l a lot of risk. So if you don't configure it quite good, uh, you can't isolate it from a logical and uh, physical perspectives. Uh, this is going to be like a, very, a serious security risk. So uh, a lot of people are not using honeypots these days. Uh, most of them are like, take sides, and they are not using it. But I find honeypots are pretty interesting security solution. Uh, why? Because they can frustrate malicious user at the extent of saving the network resources. So a malicious user, is, he will get frustrated. He's attacking your systems, attacking your mail server, your web server. And getting a honeypot on the way will raise the cost of a cyber attack. So the cost of cyber attack, it will get a little bit higher. Uh, also, uh, honeybots can identify internal compromised hosts and malicious users. So the problem is that 45% of breaches worldwide are happening internally. And it's an internal, com internal compromise or a malicious internal user. So honeybots are very effective on detecting internal threats uh, and kind of communication that happens internally between your servers. Also, honeypots can integrate with deploy security solutions. So, for example, I'm using IPS, and I'm using uh, a firewall, and the firewall got a threat, which he redirected to the honeypot, and the honeypot gave the attacker a challenge, and from there, the honeypot is now positive that this is a real attack. So it passes it again to the firewall, and the firewall blocks it, or the IPS blocks it. Uh, also, they can feed the deployed SIM solution. So a lot of people these days are using SIM solutions. Please raise your hands if you are using SIM solution in your environment. No SIM solution. Oh, one, two, three. Good. So SIM solutions are very effective for monitoring your systems, your network, and sees exactly what's going on in your systems. And the problem is with the SIM solution that they, the problem was it that the hack cases Everyone needs hack cases. You need a big database of hack cases, uh, breach cases. And the best way to get the best accurate cases is through a honeypot. Why? Because a honeypot will feed you with an accurate results, right? And those results can be automatically fed to your SIM solution, and you build up a very good database of hack cases or use cases which are customized for your environment. So you can see the real posture of the risk for your business and your network. Uh, also, honeypots can easily detect encoded and encrypted network malicious payloads. So for me, if I'm attacking X network, I would love to encode my payload, or I want to encrypt my payload to reach its destination and bypassing, for example, an IPS or a firewall. But the good thing about honeypots is that they can easily detect these kind of attacks because it's a full simulation. Honeypots are around us everywhere, but we barely notice. Uh, how many of you are using virtualization? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So virtualizations are very, very, very good. We use them. If you are looking at it for sharing resources, this is not a honeypot. But if you are looking at it from a sandbox perspective and emulating a threat, this is a honeypot. A honey, honey because you are putting a threat inside your virtual machine, and you are trying to analyze its behavior. So you are deceiving the honeypot, the, the malware that you are trying to reverse engineer or emulate with a fake environment. And this is a honeypot, right? Uh, sandboxes also are honeypots. So honeypots are around us on a daily basis. We use them, but we, don't use, we, we are not focusing enough if this is a honeypot or not. Uh, this is a very, very, very good quote. I, this is, I really believe in this. So if you miss my, my stuff, I will mess with you while I'm sleeping, because I'm too lazy. So most of the times, I'm lazy. I love automating my stuff. Most of my stuff are automated. And I'm very lazy, so I don't want to get up and respond to 
and act to an offense. So why a weaponized honeypot? Uh, to frustrate a malicious user, why to frustrate a malicious user when you can make their life miserable? This is one of the things, and, and the good thing is that if he's attacking me, I have all the right to attack him. And I'm not tracing him down. So what happens is that he attacks me, and at the same time he gets it while he's attacking me. Uh, also, why to get your valuable information stolen without know knowing who really did it? Uh, most of the time, breaches happen all over the world, and what we do when a breach happens, we hire an incident response uh, company, which comes and investigate, and they end up by, oh, okay, this is the IP address, and this guy was behind Tour or VPN, and it might be him and not might be him. So for you to detect and know exactly who did this to your environment, you will never be 100% sure, but in this case, you will. Uh, also, to collect limited information, why to collect limited information about malicious users when you can't get it all? So we use honeypots to understand the hacking me mechanisms, what the attacker wants from my environment, what he wants from my business. But the information you get is so limited, and you can get more information if you have already a full access to the attacker's machine. And the last, last but not least, why to be reactive to cyber breaches when you can be proactive and control the entire breach from your own perspective? So there is two kinds of security, and I believe in the last one. So there is passive defense, and I guess this is already dead. We used to do this for all ages. We keep implementing firewalls, uh, IPSs, IDSs, SIM solutions. We get a lot of people to see the kind of traffic that goes in and goes out of our network, and eventually we get breached. So this was nice, maybe in 1999 or 2000, but these days we need an active defense. We need to understand what's compromising our network. And even if we are not paying back, at least we need to see a full picture of what's going on in our environment. So active defense is offensive, and in the same time, it's defense. So you are defending your network, but actively. So uh, how you can detect an attack at the network level? Uh, actually, I found that it's pretty easy. Most of the honeypots these days can detect a lot of network attacks. So what happens is that the malicious traffic gets routed from a network security solution, like an IPS, an IDS, right? Firewall to the honeypot. So my security solution in my environment detects an attack. It doesn't know it's a false positive or a scanner or a bot or whatever. And it redirects the attack to the honeypot. So we have two chances right now. It's an automated attack made by a tool or a persistent hacker who are doing this manually. So the honeypot starts by validating if the ongoing attack is automated or manually conducted by a person. And this is the most important part. We don't want to attack a bot. We don't want to attack someone in the middle has been a, his machine get abused and he's doing attack on the attacker's behalf. We need to fully know that we are attacking the person who's doing this. Uh, once the honeypot detects and validates which kind of user is playing with the network, uh, it will activate the passive defense. So uh, the passive defense, it's one of two things. So if it's an automated attack, it will slow it down. So for example, if it's a scanner behavior and you're scanning all ports and trying to fuzz, it will make it very slow, very slow, very slow, very slow, without raising a lot of suspicious. And if, it's, and if it was a manually conducted, then the honeypot will respond to an offense, but only on the case of a manual breach. Uh, what it will do, it will redirect the traffic once again to another honeypot. And this honeypot is a little bit interesting, So this honeypot, uh, I like to call the exploitation framework. And in this exact honeypot, all ports will be closed, except for port 80. From a server perspective, the attacker will not be able to compromise it from a server or a network side. So what the attacker will do? He will open his browser and see what's going on, right? And this is exactly what I want him to do. So. Uh, the attacker will voluntarily change his attack from a network attack to a web application attack. And this is when he turns into a clueless victim. So from the web, uh, the intruder will get fingerprinted and exploited automatically in the middle of his attempts to exploit his covered web application. So I tried as much as I can 
to take the attack from a network, totally network perspective, but it's too much work. And I guess it's like a little, a little bit hard to automate uh, because you have to discover the open ports, you have to do reconnaissance, you have to do exploitation. And some of these steps are going to take a lot of time to emulate. I'm working on it right now, but I didn't nail it just yet. So the network attack, I move it to a web application attack. So detecting an attack at the application level. So how we detect an offense at the application level. So malicious user uh, traffic gets routed uh, to the application security solutions, like a WAF, for example. Uh, or we can implement some custom traps. And I do this all the time. It's pretty fun. So how we can implement custom traps in our web application. There is a lot of ideas, but those are the main three ideas that I use these days. Uh, so I use honey tokens. So in my database, Every application, every web application these days needs a database to interact, right? And of course, there is an admin user uh, with, with user ID 1, right? So what I do that, I make an admin user and I change, totally change his name from admin to Alice or Adam or something else. And I remove anything that indicates that this user is an administrator. So make it all null. And the first user on the database, I make it like administrator. And in the, in the description, I can call it God Administrator, who can control everything. And I can put the password for it, like very easy to break, MD5 or something very lurid. And what happened is that once an attacker compromises my database, he will just like automatically go for the first entry with, with user ID number one, the God user. And he will try, start to take it and authenticate with the web application. And this is when he gets detected. So. At this point, the malicious user tried to use my decoy, and that's when I get altered, and I know that there is a database breach, and I can, at this point, shut down the entire web application and try to deal with him. Uh, also, there is something called honey pages. Honey pages are very interesting also, so you can uh, inject uh, some secret pages on the comments, you know, uh, or hidden values, uh, and make it very invisible for people, normal people, to face or encode. Uh, and they can use to identify a persistent attack. Someone is going manually through your pages, viewing your source code, what's going on. And honey domains, of course, they are dummy DNS entries, uh, which are published at subdomain level. And they can use to identify an active reconnaissance or discovery. So responding to an application offense is very easy. So the traffic gets routed once more from the honeypot or directly from the web application to the exploitation again environment, and it's a web-based. So he gets fingerprinted and popped. So active defense equals offensive security plus artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. I know that a lot of people say that I can't pull this off, but I already did. I have a working proof of concept for this. So how logically it can be done? So let's, let's take it very easy, right? Very simple. And I will break it down for you. So any successful exploitation starts with what? We recon, we identify, we exploit, right? And we backdoor to ensure further access easily. Uh, this point. Uh, sometimes we face a lot of problems. For example, the malicious user, these days we are 2006, almost 2016, so the malicious users will never come to you using their plain computer or plain. They will mostly use Tor, VPN, or intermediate system to break into your network. So uh, right now we need to understand what should be done to unreveal the identity of this user and exploit his system. And this is two different faces. So for the attack, we need to de-anonymize first. Uh, we need to identify the user, and we need to enumerate him, exploit him, excluding privileges, and being persistent. Uh, De-anonymizing uh, the user can easily happen uh, using uh, or focusing on client-side attacks. So every browser has weakness, right? Uh, all of us use JavaScript these days, all of us. Uh, and I, I know that if I ask it, everyone will raise his hands. Everyone is using JavaScript. Uh, some of us are using Flash, uh, maybe uh, Java also, uh, some media players on their browser. And I wrote a model called Dynamic Detect. Uh, Dynamic Detect is basically is abusing these kind of uh, 
browsers, uh, this kind of browser plugins and browser functionality, and abusing some functionality at HTML5 uh, to leverage the real identity of a user who's browsing through my servers and systems. And uh, Dynamic Detect is a very pretty smart. Um, so Dynamic, Dynamic Detect it's, has a very friendly name. Uh, it's not friendly. It's a very sophisticated offensive model. Uh, it can effectively and robustly uh, denominize, uh, identify, attack, and profile, which I call it DIAP, uh, malicious users, uh, basically behind tours, VPNs, or proxies. And even if a user is uh, using an intermediate system, I still can reveal his identity. So what's the technical features of Dynamic Detect? Uh, Dynamic Detect is capable of de-anonymizing any malicious user flawlessly and accurately on the fly. So you visit a page two seconds, and your identity has been revealed. Uh, it's also capable of identifying malicious users' IP address, country, city, and coordinates. Of course, the coordinates will not be so accurate because it's based on, you, uh, uh, on the provider, which are giving you. But it's, you can say it's like 200 or 300 miles accurate. Uh, also, it can enumerate malicious users' machine and spot every single weakness. And when I say every single weakness, I'm not talking about server-side. I'm talking about your browser. So, you, for example, you're using IE6, and you have X number of exploits available. You're using Flash. You have X number of exploits available, and it will try to exploit everyone on the fly, like exploit skits. But after, of course, de-anonymizing your machine. Uh, it's also capable of exploiting every single weakness. It Identified, so it will identify it. It will do enumeration, then it do exploitation after de-anonymizing your machine, and it will exclude privileges uh, under most operating systems despite deploy security controls. So imagine with one click, and he's gone. Uh, and also, it's capable of maintaining access and staying still C even in the most strict environments. And I had to, lo to write a lot of custom code for this, a lot. Uh, it can, it can profile each malicious user and with detailed activity log. So, and it can put some persistent entries on his machine. So uh, I use five different techniques to poison the attacker's machine. Uh, persistent cookies, uh, HTML5 uh, local storage, SQL local storage. So I have like five different mechanisms to make sure that when he comes back, I know that this guy, he came before and he was doing one, two, three, four. Uh, this is how it exactly works. Uh, so I have a back-end server, right? This guy was the black hat. I forgot my hat is there. <laughs> anyway, so I have a back-end server, as you can see, and the back-end server has six models. So I have delimization model, identification, enumeration, exploitation, escalation, and persistence. And Alice is our malicious user. I choose a friendly name here. And Alice is using Tour to attack my network. And from here, she jumped on the first hop, second hop, third hop, and my honeypot gave her this web page. And from there, I can denominize, identify, enumerate, exploit, escalate my privilege, and being persistent. And my communication flows back over an encrypted medium. So for her, even if she has security controls in place, she's in a very bad situation. Right? So right now, I've been able to successfully uh, deliver a payload uh, to Alison's machine, and she doesn't even know. So she thinks that she's fully anonymous, but her traffic got forwarded to a web page, and out of the sudden, her machine is not hers anymore. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm facing some technical issues with my own server. Uh, I have the proof concept code working, and I, I wanted, really wanted to demonstrate it to you. I did it before, but. I don't know what's going on with it. Uh, I think it's like something to do with more security on my server. So I apply a lot of serious security on my server, and it gave me a very hard time. That's why my presentation got delayed for a bit. But anyway, I'm working on it. Maybe in like 13 minutes or less than an hour, I can work and we can meet again. And I demonstrate it to you on the flight. It will take like one, two minutes maximum. If, if it's possible, of course. I don't know the organizers. So yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, my direct manager, my best friend, for pushing me forward all the way, right, Shashir, uh, and showing me the light where it's too damn dark. And I would also would like to thank the organizers, uh, DevCamp, especially uh, those nice guys, uh, Andrian and uh, Florina. Thank you so much.